Hello, good morning, Samad. Hello, is it ready, Samad? Ah, okay, okay. Once it's ready, you just ring me, yeah.
yeah good morning again so the mic was muted i guess okay so it's nice to see all of us together in the morning to have a small discussion on uh, the sustainable health and also uh, ensuring accessibility promoting health and saving lives so in reality so many people are you know doing so much of research on how to promote health and then again saving lives and then today the sessions i have seen there are uh, people from nursing and also from the indigenous medicine right but then my topic is going to be a little different but then it's more based on chemistry but then we are going to use nanomaterials to see how we can improve health and also how we can save this environment also right so to start off with i'm going to start uh, what does it mean by nanotechnology so the nanotechnology is a technology where that we use the matter right and then again we are going to make some molecules right which is very closer to atomic level so atom is very closer to atomic number it's not atom right but then again closer to atomic level so atoms are around here you can see is 10 to the power minus 10 right so we are going to make synthesize this material which is one unit down from atom which is 10 to the power minus 9 which is nanomaterials right so these molecules are making wonders so they have a huge amount of applications that we here you can see they are in healthcare especially and also in industries and also in their renewable energy and also food agriculture textiles biomedical environment and again enormous applications are there right to see um, whether these these uh, the use of nanomaterials have been already utilized right so so in my presentation, in my presentation, right, I'm going to use these nanomaterials, right, to improve health and also improve the environment. So when it comes to health, right, so we we human beings that we are struggling with this free radical mediated disease because you guys you all know that what does it mean by free radicals the free radicals are the the substances you know they have an unpaired electron so they tend to attack right in our body so in our body also there are loads of free radicals are there but then we have to have an antioxidant in order in order to neutralize them so the free radicals if they if they uh, take electrons from those ones are unstable molecule if they take electrons from fatty acids then again it's going to have a, a lipid peroxidation and then again if that is going to take an electron from a DNA, it's going to have a mutation, especially as cancer. And also, if that is going to take electron from proteins, that we are going to have enzyme inhibition and also we are going to have degradation also. So, in 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 order to prevent those, right, these free radicals, that's what we have to have an antioxidant in our body. So that's why people they say, okay, we have to have a very good, rich antioxidant, uh, uh, rich foods that we have to eat, right? So if the antioxidants are less and also free radicals are higher in our body, then we are going to have an oxidative stress, and then we might have a chronic injuries, and then it's going to lead to cancer and also like arthro uh, Uh, and also CVDs and also especially the Alzheimer's disease also. So mainly if you can look at it that what are the foods that you know we have high antioxidants so we must take antioxidants especially these organic fruits and then again fruits and also nuts and herbs and spices but then if you look at this current world right people are adultering uh, most of the food and also you know the foods have these pesticides chemicals so then we are not too sure what sort of food what we are eating, whether those ones are real or not. Or maybe are we eating something which is not good for our body. So then what we thought was, okay, maybe we can utilize some of these waste materials, right? Some of the waste materials. So if you look at it, the seaweeds are there, but then again, of course, and also this, we, we, we are using these uh, rose. The roses are the roses as the, um, you know, uh, like an ornament. But then again, you know, the rose leaves that we are not utilizing them, those ones are like waste products. And also, if you can see um, uh, this, uh, uh, this banana, banana, right? Entire banana, um, the tree is like, is not being used after when that runs, where after we cultivate, right? So we can use these uh, banana tree uh, leaves and also maybe these flowers, right? And also, you know, there are things that, you know, you wouldn't have even used in our life, day-to-day -day life. It's like especially these mango leaves, right? 
and then in banana leaves that we have utilized them. So those ones are the waste product to synthesize. And also, you know, this one is cowpea leaves and also here you can see oaky leaves. So these ones that we are not utilizing day to day, right? So these ones are just waste material. So we have used that to synthesize silver nanoparticles. So nanoparticles, right? So as I told you, these ones are just one unit down from from the atomic level. So we can, there are two mechanisms. One is bottom-up method and also there was a top-down uh, method, right? So bottom-up method is how uh, the bottom-up method is utilizing this method by using this atom and then again we are going to build nanoparticles. But the top down where that, you know, there is a huge particle that you might have to grind and there are several other techniques, you have to make it to nanoparticles. So what we do is we are taking this um, uh, bottom up method, right? So which is which is from the atomic level, we are going to synthesize silver nanoparticle. And so in that, you know, so we are going to we are going to use this bioreduction. So by using um, a green synthesis, right, in which we can use even plants or fungal or even bacteria. But then again, you know, for, due to these biohazards, we are using only by using the plants only, right? So how are we going to synthesize silver nanoparticle? The silver nanoparticles, so as I told you, we are going to start off from a metal atoms, right? Metal ions. So then in this case, I have used uh, silver and also gold, right? So the silver ions are there. And then these silver ions needs to get stabilized. So then again, these the stabilizing agent, that's what I have already talked about, these antioxidants. So antioxidants in these leaves and flowers, yeah, they are going to encapsulate these silver ions and then they are going to form. So then these, these antioxidants, so then the antioxidants might have these OH, right, OH and also the car, carbonyl groups, they will reduce this, they will reduce, right, that M plus, so then you can silver ions, the plus one to M zero, right? So then again, they are going to make this atom, right? And then from there, it's going to get encapsulated and it's going to form a nucleation and also the stabilization. And then we are going to form a silver nanoparticle. So that how to characterize them. So we can characterize them by using these, these um, so UV spectroscopy, right? And that UV spectroscopy uh, is, uh, if you have a peak between 400 to 480, that's going to give an indication that's the presence of silver nanoparticle, right? And also because that is due to that on the surface of, silver nanoparticle on there is a these these electrons they are going to resonate at the wavelength which is called surface plasma resonance and that comes around 410 to 480 right and also that we can further characterize them by using like SEM analysis so here you can see these particles are uh, spherical and also they are within the nanoparticle range right and these nanoparticles right we have already uh, we could see and also we can synthesize these nanoparticles. Say, suppose if you need uh, within 10 uh, nanometers, or maybe if you need a particular size, particular shape, by changing the solvent, changing the substrate, and also changing the conditions that we should be able to uh, synthesize these nanoparticles. So the methodology is right, it is quite simple, right? So you are supposed to extract that. So we, are, as I said, we are using an eco-friendly uh, method. So you can uh, extract. These maybe okay, for an example here, I have showed here as a guava leaf, right? So uh, by using water, and then again we can extract by boiling them, and then we just have to add AgNO3, and then again we are going to make these silver nanoparticles, right? And then, right? And then as I told that we have to characterize them by using UV and also further the spectral studies, and also we have done the antimicrobial studies also, right? And the antioxidant properties that we have used uh, these uh, these assays to uh, uh, characterize them, right? And so the flavonoid, the TFC and TPC, and also the TAC, also we have done. So when it comes to uh, TFC, right, this is quite quite easy to see that a total flavonoid content, if you can see, right, that light blue one, it shows the water extract, and then we can, uh, that blue, green color one, it shows the nano uh, nanoparticle. If, if you can see the nanoparticle, the same amount of, the product, right? When you synthesize silver nanoparticle, their properties are double, not even double, triple, because of the silver. The silver has this property because it has the surface to volume ratio is very high, and also they have quite they have the capacity and they can boost this property to the maximum level, right? So the same amount of sample, right? 
So instead of using like the water extract, if you can use, if you can synthesize the water extract, right, as a nanoparticle, and then again with these, these, uh, these sample, they can exert their properties, which can further can be seen in the phenolic content. Also the phenolic content that here you can see, the phenolic contents, are quite high in silver nanoparticle and also as a whole total antioxidant capacity also very high in the silver nanoparticle. So that's that shows right in further we can even make a tablet right tablets by using this using this waste material where if you want to have a high amount of phenols or maybe high amount of flavonols but then again when it comes to the silver nanoparticle there the properties will be excellent right. And the antimicrobial properties also we have we have uh, I have shown here right. So when it comes to Staphylococcus aureus, it doesn't show much of these uh, uh, these properties right. But then again, when it comes to E. coli, you can see the nanoparticle shows a high zone of inhibition. So then again, that also we can see they are very good. Uh, they are they they are showing a very high and uh, antimicrobial properties also right. So further we have characterized, so here you can see the amount of the waste materials, the waste leaves, right? We have utilized to calculate the TFC, TPC, and also we have calculated the IC50. And when it comes to IC50 here, you can clearly see that AGNP shows the lower than the, the water extract, right? And this is also another important phenomena that, you know, I'm just going to show you the photo degradation of azotides. So the photo degradation of azo dyes, the, 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 reason, the reason behind this photo degradation of the azo dyes, so even you all can see, we all are wearing different, different colors, right? And these color dyes, so then again, the, the cloth that right, is being uh, dyed by these azo dyes, so then it can be methyl orange or indigo. But what they do is once they are, once they are done with these dyeing these uh, clothes, what they do is instead of discarding or maybe recycling properly what they're doing is they're just chucking them onto the ground so then it goes to the groundwater and it's polluting and then it's, it's a kind of a carcinogen so then it getting into the marine life also so through that it's getting into this food chain right and thereby people also getting sickness so there are several methods to degrade these dyes but then these conventional method is kind of costly and also sometimes it can by using the chemical it also can produce Right, a toxic material. So therefore, we have utilized these um, silver nanoparticles, right? So then again, here you can see these these ones are like you know these factories are throwing these dyes, and then again down the stream, and then is getting polluted, right? And then here you can see right, eighty per sixty to eighty percent of these organic compounds are like you know getting disposed. So therefore, without a proper method, so therefore most of these like Marayan or maybe like, you know, it can even get into human life and then it's getting, it might be a carcinogen for our, for our human lives also. So what we have to do is we can utilize these nanoparticles. So then again, I'm just going to show you one of the results that we have used it from, uh, we have synthesized from uh, uh, Yasmin, right? So the Yasmin also is again that we are just using it as, a, as an ornament flower. So we are not util utilizing much, but then again, their properties as a silver nanoparticle, that is an extreme, right? So what we did was we have uh, used this uh, methylene blue, right? And then again, we just wanted to degrade and then you can see clearly, right? That the, with over time, the way that the methylene blue peak has degraded, right? And also there's another flower, is a Catharanthus roseus. So then again, they would say it's a symmetric flower. None of us are utilizing that, but then again, the properties as silver nanoparticle is like, huge here you can see so what we have done was we have so this is for methyl orange what we have done was we have changed the concentrations of silver nanoparticle to see how that affect so how much of silver nanoparticle that we are supposed to use so here we have uh, one concentration right here it's around uh, two millimolar uh, concentration of methyl orange and also agnp is 750 ppm so it didn't degrade well but then again when you have so here, so when it when you add 750 ppm, so higher concentration of AGNP, probably maybe that they are coagulating or maybe some further reaction is happening. So it didn't degrade well. So but when you reduce the concentration of silver nanoparticle from 750 to 250 ppm, you can see they are degrading so 
well so then so a small amount of silver nanoparticle it's enough right to show these dyes can be degrade within so if you can see right the color changes also from from uh, like dark yellow to then again the way that it degrades and then again it forms a, a like total color solution even within 30 minutes right so then these these silver nanoparticles have a high impact in the society right so by by having this impact then again we can able to rescue the human life right and also another one that I'm going to show you, a photocatalytic activity of, of uh, paranitrophenol. The paranitrophenol is also a toxic compound, right? And I can you hear also, uh, we can, uh, uh, they are also using this as a, for dyes and also a paracetamol synthesis, right? So that also is very difficult to reduce even by using sodium borohydride. So one of the research that we have done recently by using this Justica genus, right, for some of this compound, so what happens uh, when you uh, uh, reduce this paranitrophenol by using sodium borohydride rather than again to paraaminophenol, it takes time and then again is very difficult. But then if you add a bit of bit of this catalyst, so like silver nanoparticle as a catalyst, what's going to happen? This activation energy is going to get reduced. So therefore, this catalyst is going to like you know by by changing this pathway, this catalyst. This silver nanoparticle catalyst is, is facilitating the reaction. So therefore, this paranitrophenol is forming the paraaminophenol. So which I'm going to show you here, right? So here, if you can see, this is the paranitrophenol, right? With sodium borohydride, the figure number 26, just alone, there was no degradation. But then again, when you add this AGNB, you can see there's a degradation within 11 minutes. And then the paranitrophenol, to uh, paraaminophenol. So then paranitrophenol, right, you can see, which is around 400 to 430, that the peak is getting reduced and then it became, became flat. But then there's a nice thing that you could see, right? So how we can identify the paranitrophenol became paraaminophenol. The paraaminophenol, right, it forms a peak, right, here around 200. 80 to 200 and sorry uh, 290 to 300 which you can see this this thing is getting reduced right there are is getting reduced and there are other fever, the formation also you can see clear so that also gives an indication this the the degradation is is complete right and also here you can see right you know further also you know by change by by uh, because we have used uh, several uh, agnps right and also within 15 minutes, we should be able to degrade. And also we wanted to check whether the toxicity of these silver nanoparticles, right? And also we have, uh, by using the, uh, the brine shrimp that we have tested and to see, right, it is 100, the viability, the 100% they could able to survive even after 24, even at different, different concentration of the AGMP, high concentration. And also we have used a low concentration and also we have done, used a positive control so they could able to survive. So that means for the marine system, these ones are very safe, right? And I have taken these, uh, this silver nanoparticle further with, uh, I'm collaborating with uh, Thailand and also we have a collaboration with them. So what do they do is like, you know, they're the students, they come from uh, Thailand and also we had a conference here and then they came and presented and also they have, so with them only I'm working on the, um, on the uh, uh, silver nanoparticle synthesis, sorry, uh, nanoparticle synthesis with gold, right? And so here our students also, they went, we had a student exchange program. And also what we are trying to do is we are using this bamboo extract for cosmetic products because these, as I showed you, these silver nanoparticles, they do have antimicrobial properties. So then most of these products, right? Some of the some of some of the products where people are finding it when they are applying on your face, people are getting these pimples. So then if you can incorporate this silver nanoparticle, because since they have an antibacterial property. We are. We can utilize them. So we have started working on the uh, like. So there is a product where we have called it as Sushada, and these bamboo extracts, right? By but then again, here we didn't use only one of these bamboo, uh, the entire bamboo extract. We have isolated one of these flavonoids, right? And then we have uh, one of the flavonoids, and then again, this is the uh, the product, and then we have uh, we have tested for TPC, and then again TAC, and 
and uh, further on. And then we have utilized that to form this also. And also this is one of these, uh, the peony flower. The peony color flower is also one of these uh, very uh, 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 good source, right? And then here we have uh, uh, isolated this peony in B and then we can peony in and to synthesize these uh, products, right? And then again, this is another one that um, I just wanted to show that how we have synthesized silver nanoparticle. This is a, this is not a silver nanoparticle, but then again, these ones are gold nanoparticles. So I just wanted to show you the presence of gold nanoparticles. And then that is also further characterized by TEM, right? And then you can see these TEM, these values are like very uh, small um, uh, silver nanoparticle is around 20 to 30 nanometers, right? That also clearly shows that the presence of silver nanoparticle. And then this is also, we have the mineral uh, cleanser water. So this is also, right, we have used for just to cleanse after the 24 hours of work. And then again, you know, just to keep body or face from uh, this, any uh, bacteria or maybe any microbial stuff. So we have made this mineral water, so the cleansing water, right? And then this is the hand cream and then again lotions, right, with this, uh, and uh, anti-aging, right? So some of the body. And this is the, the last slide that I wanted to show you, right? So this is the one that we are expanding further because there are there are some of these metals that, you know, when the dentists, they are when they have an implant, right? So most of them, they have uh, lots of gum disease, right? And then again, it seems they are finding very difficult to cure them. So what we have done was, we are incorporating this silver nanoparticle, we are coating the silver nanoparticle onto that metal. So then silver nanoparticle, they have these antibacterial properties, right? So therefore, we are hoping, we are working and we are testing also, and then again, we have tested on some wound healing and, and we are working on that. So it seems it gave very positive results. So then again, we are hoping that they won't have this kind of diseases further, right? And I really hope that you guys have understood, I hope that you have enjoyed and then I can understood that importance of silver nanoparticle in this society and then you can how we can utilize them to have a better environment and also better health. And thank you for understanding. Listen, thank you. Thank you. If you have any question that you can ask. Uh, Dr. Vijita? Yes, yes, Sapa. Uh, Dr. Vijita, uh, <coughs> you can start the keynote speech. Can you hear my work? Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's, is it clear? Yes, it's clear. Okay, okay. So, if you stop this, yes. Okay, right. Okay, are the slides are visible? Uh, yes. Okay. Very good morning to all. Uh, today, uh, I have selected the topic for the keynote speech, the challenges and future prospect of herbal medicine. I am Dr. Vichita Bairadhan. I am the senior lecturer attached to Faculty of Siddha Medicine, Trigamali Campus, Eastern University, Sri Lanka. And also, I am working as a director of the University College of Jaffna. So today this topic is related with the herbal medicine as most of the audience and the presenters are related with the field of indigenous medicine. This term is not a new term for us for the term of the herbal medicine. But there are three, uh, four traditional system of medicines are included under the way, under the white term that is called as a indigenous medical system in Sri Lanka. The Ayurvedic medicine, Siddha medicine, Yunani medicine and the traditional medicines are included under the term of indigenous medical sciences. So as we all are well aware, the herbal, ind indigenous medical system is using 
not only herbs but also animal kingdoms metals minerals and some and some toxic materials that means pashpasil pa, um, sorry pashanangal for preparing the medicines for our system but uh, this uh, today for the today presentation i have selected only the herbs the herbs that that medicines is using for the prevention and as well as treatment of the human diseases so the herbal medicine the ayurveda siddha junani traditional medicines also includes under the term of herbal medicines so the herbal medicines it's the the name of the herbal medicines phyto medicines because we are choosing the phytochemicals to prepare the medicines that's why it's called as a phyto medicines is related to juice different part parts of medicinal plants we are using the different from the leaves up to the root we are using the different parts for the preparing medicines that's why it's called as a phyto medicines the herbalism has not a deep tradition of its application outside of the conventional medicine the conventional medicine here the term mainly related with the allopathic medical system in the past decades it's now become a mainstream and advancement stage and the development in analysis and the quality control along with the advances in clinical researches the herbal medicine reaches the advanced level in the analytical is uh, 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 analytical side as well as the clinical research side as per the who definitions the herbal medicine is really defined as a sum total of the knowledge skills and the practice based on the theories beliefs and experiences of indigenous to different culture different culture means tamil community has the has different culture singhala community has different la culture like as the muslim community has a different culture they all have their own medical system own theories own beliefs own experiences whether these are explicable or not juice the maintenance of the health as well as the prevention diagnosis improvement or treatment of the physical as well as mental illness this is the definition the who has given for the herbal medicine so the herbal medicine approaches the human as a holistic way holistic way of the medicine so the herbal medicine have been widely used for the beneficiary of the mankind for thousands of year much before the development of the allopathic drug system before the development of the allopathic drug system the herbal medicine is using by the people so the herbal medicine still cover up the 70 to 80% of the primary health care approaches of the person develop in the developing country of the world because of the general belief that the herbal drugs has no side effect instead of being cheap and the uh, easily available because of the affordability and the side effects still 70 per, 70 to 80% of the people getting the herbal medicines it's also contributing the primary health care in the health system so as for the who the phyto medicine exceed to that of the conventional medicine by about three times <clears throat> so this is the the picture of the herbs the herb herbal is word, herbal is the word of the high value now after the covid pandemic the terms herbs has the high value because the whole world turns into the herbal medicine so because of that the now the natural products or herbal drugs become a very big business in the world <clears throat> so the what is the present scenario in the herbal medicines so it's believed they contribute 90 percentage to the new drug modules that means the conventional drug modules the modern medicine as we well aware the anti cancer drugs anti malarial drugs anti diabetic drugs anti anti hiv drugs all these drug physical all these drugs compositions are taken from the the uh, um, medicinal herbs so the 90 percentage of the new drug modules are developing from the herbs nowadays this is the present scenario so the who project that global market will grow up the global market for the herbal herbs will grow up to 5 billion trillion dollar in 2055 trillion dollar trillion of dollar in 2050 from the current level that is of 62 billion dollars so more than 70 percentage of the global diversity are produced by india and china the significant herbal export market includes not only india and china is the european countries usa canada australia singapore japan 
while Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, China, and Indonesia are new emerging global market nowadays. This is the present scenario and happiest news for the indigenous people, now, the status of the global market status uh, nowadays. So the, there are new, there are countries now emerging the global market, the Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and China, and Indonesia. So what are the challenges the herbal medicine is associated? The herbal medicines are introduced into the market without any mandatory safety or toxicological evaluation regarding the effect of drugs. When the new herbal medicines are introduced to the market without the safety monitoring or the quality control, it comes to the market. So that, that product cannot be sustained to the market. That is one of the challenges associated with the commercialization of the herbal products. Many of these countries are also lack effective machineries to regulate the manufacturing practice and maintain the quality standards of the herbal medicines because the most of the developing countries are using the herbal medicines for their primary health care. So they don't have the effective machineries to regulate, regulate the manufacturing practices. That means preparing the medicines and also maintain the quality of the standards when preparing the medicine and prescribing the medicines. That is the another challenges the herbal medicine is facing. So the challenges often encountered are uh, and common to many countries are those related to the regulatory status, uh, uh, assessment of safety and efficacy, quality control, safety monitoring, and inadequate or poor knowledge about traditional complementary and alternative medicines. So I will discuss one by one. So the first one is the challenges associated the regulatory status of the herbal medicines, uh, not only herbal medicines, natural products also. When we uh, discover the new herbal medicines or natural product from the herbs, when it comes to the market, that means when we do the commercialization, they are, uh, we should accredit our product in the standard accredited bodies for like that. DSHEA and the FDA. DSHEA, the expansion is Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. So as per this act, this uh, association is made. So we should accredit our product in this, in this association. So we, to do the accreditation, we should follow proper procedure to produce this drug or to produce this natural product. So the DSHEA, any additional toxicity studies are generally not required if the herb has been on the market before 1994. So for this, FDA holds the burden to prove the herbal medicine product or dietary ingredients is toxic or not safe for the use. The additional major challenges in many countries is related to the fact that the regulatory information of herbal medicine is often not shared between the regulatory authorities and safety monitoring or pharmacovigilance centers. So they, they don't have the good collaboration between the pharmacovigilance center and the safety monitoring committees between the, uh, the between these accredited bodies and the pharmaco pharmacovigilance centers as well as the research research centers so if we have the knowledge about the accreditation and the register register our local product to that accredited body then only the, the researchers will follow the methods and get the accreditation from these bodies. So the next challenge is the herbal medicine is facing regarding the assessment of the safety and the efficacy. So no one can contradict the fact of the requirement as well as the research protocol standards and methods need for the evaluation of the safety and efficacy of herbal medicines are much more complex than those required for conventional or orthodox pharma pharmaceuticals. Our herbal medicines are using for, the, using for more than thousands of years without proving, without proving this epic, uh, safety and the effectiveness in a scientific manner, scientific manner without proving this safety and efficacy that doctors are prescribing the people are using the medicines. So without proving the scientific, scientifically, we couldn't get the global market recognition. That is the basic main issue the herbal medicine is facing. The single herbal medicines or medicinal plant may contain more than 100 of natural constitution, natural chemical constitutions. So the mixed herbal medicine product may contain several several times the number of one. The in such analysis of a single active constitution may practically impossible, especially where an herbal product is a mixture of two or more herbs. 
as we all are well aware there are some medicines are uh, preparing from the single medicinal herbs some medicines are using the combina combination of the medicinal plants the mis sometimes it's the 20 medicinal plants so more than 20 medicinal plants we are using to prepare one medicine so one single herbal plant has thousands of sometimes hundreds of chemical constitutions so it's impossible to analyze all these chemical constitutions when we prepare the combination of the medicines combinations of the plants to prepare the medicines so the next challenges where the herbal medicine is facing is the main problem the quality control of the herbal medicines so the, the preparing medicine starts from the collection of the raw material the harvesting the raw materials so the quality of the raw material is the main things in the quality control so used in the production of herbal medicines determines to a large extent to the safety and the efficacy. Everything is depends on the quality of the raw material. So the quality of the source or raw material is dependent not only on the intrinsic factors, but also in the extrinsic factors. What are the extrinsic factors are influencing in the quality control side? The environmental conditions, good agriculture conditions and the good collection practices for the medicinal plants, the good collection practices for the medicinal plants, including plant selection and cultivation. Sometimes if the plant collection is wrong, then the total, the chemical composition, the total value of the plant is lost. So when we use the substitutes for, the, for preparing the medicines, the expected outcome will not be arrived. So these are the quality control side issues. So it is a combination of many factors that make it difficult to perform the quality control on the raw material of the herbal medicines. So we should ensure the raw materials are uh, in, a, in, in a sufficient quality, has the sufficient quality to prepare the medicines. So that according to the good manufacturing practice, according to the GMP, the correct identification of the species of medicinal plants, it starts from the correct identification of the medicinal plants. Uh, I already said you when we use the adult, uh, when we use the misidentified plants, then it will affect the outcome of the medicines. So the correct identity, first we should identify, identify correctly the exact plants, what we are using the prepared medicines. Then we should ensure the storage the all the medicinal raw materials are storage in the proper temperature and the special cleaning methods for various materials is important requirements for the quality control of starting the materials that means the cleaning methods it includes not only cleaning but also the purification method also what the purification methods mentioned in the textbook we should follow properly to purify that medicine then only we will ensure there is no toxicity, toxic, toxic materials are available in the raw materials. So the major challenges are quality control of finished herbal medicinal products, especially in the mixture of herbal products. So from the raw material up to the finished products, we should ensure the quality control of the uh, herbal medicine preparing process. So hence the general requirement and methods are methods for quality control of finished herbal products remain much more complex than other pharmaceuticals. To ensure the safety and efficacy of the herbal medicines, the WHO continues to endorse the institutions of quality assurance and control methods such, such as the national quality specification standards for the herbal materials, the good manufacturing practice, labeling, licensing schemes for manufacturing. There are several methods WHO introduces to maintain the safety and the efficacy of the herbal medicines. So the next challenge is what the herbal medicine is facing about the safety monitoring of the herbal medicines in the past few years. The issues relating to increasing use of the herbals or natural medicines or products in the developed countries also, not only developing countries, the developed countries also, uh, the, trend, the trending for using the herbal medicine is increasing after the COVID pandemic. So the adverse effect rising from the consumption of the herbal medicines are due to several factors. So among which include the, the wrong species of the plant. In the previous slide also I mentioned about the wrong species and the adulteration of the herbal medicines. And other one is the lack of proper knowledge regarding the importance of taxonomic botany and the documentations of the manufacturers or manufacturers of the herbal medicines. Because of that, the peculiar challenges are facing during the identification and collection of the medicinal plants used for the herbal remedies.
So to overcome this confusion created because of the common names, one plant has many common names because of that the confusion is created. It is necessary to adapt most commonly used by binomial names for the medicinal plants. When we use the botanical name, then this confusion we can reduce, reduce, uh, reduce gradually. So for example, the Adramesia amsindium is which is, has the 11 common names contains an active narcotic derivatives. Hence, the effective monitoring of the herbal medicine will require effective collaboration between the botanist, phytochemist, pharmacologist and other major stakeholders because of the inter interdisciplinary approaches only we can reduce these challenges and we will recognize in the global market. So what about the future prospect of the herbal medicines? So the future is the phase of increasing demand and fast growing market of the herbal medicines and other herbal care products, not only medicines, the natural herbal care products in both developing and developing countries of the world. The usage of the herbal medicines and the herbal natural product will be increased in the global uh, markets, the fast growing markets. So the conclusion slide. So in this scenario, the global acceptance and the use of herbal medicines and related products continue to assume the exponential increase. So issues related to adverse relations, reactions in recent times are also becoming more vivid. The increase in the prevalence and no longer de de debatable because of the previous misconception of the categorizing the herbal medicines products as safe as they are derived from the natural resource, natural sources. Since the herbs are uh, derived from the natural resources, the, it's, it's always safe. So this brand was given before thousands of years. So therefore, the regulatory policies on the herbal medicines need to be standardized and strengthened on the global scale. To meet the global market needs, we should standardize and strengthen our Strengthen based on the global scale, the every every herbal medicine should be standardized and strengthened on a global scale. It's now laid in the shoulders of the regulatory bodies. So the responsibility is given to the regulatory bodies to monitor, control, and quality flow of herbal products and to facilitate their development of the clinical trial stages based on the clinical trial decision, clinical trial conclusions, and the Laboratory studies only we can get the accreditation for our natural products or herbal medicines before go for the commercialization or before go for the market. So first we should finish the clinical uh, clinical trial and the laboratory studies. Laboratory studies that I mean the standardization of the herbal medicine, the phytochemical studies, the physiochemical studies, then the activity studies. The, all these studies should be completed before the um, Isolation of the chemical composition, all these studies should be completed before go for the commercialization. Before go, go for the commercialization process, we should get the accreditation from the, from the recognized WHO institutions. That means DHSA and the FDA. Thank you very much for, my, for listening to my presentation. If there is any doubt, you can ask the questions. Nowadays, the commercialization of the herbal products are in a very big topic. The most of the persons are discussed about the commercialization of the natural products. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijita. Uh, now uh, we can start from here. Uh, in person uh, presenters, okay. First, I'd like to invite WIS Pranand from <laughs> Open University of Sri Lanka. He is present in the association between intermittent uh, chronic pain experience quality of life.
Uh, very good morning to all attendees. And I'm Mr. W.I.S. Fernando from the Open University of Sri Lanka. So first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to organizing team for letting me to, uh, and accepting our extended abstract and also letting us to present it. And our research study is the association between intermittent chronic pain experience and quality of life among all the adults with peripheral vascular disease. And there are six authors from the Open University of Sri Lanka. So I am the presenting author. So first of all, I will move to the background part. So as we know, the peripheral vascular disease is uh, characterized by blood clots and also plagues. And also it will lead to the arterial blocks. And some studies found that this is a common condition causing intermittent pain and also ischemia. And also here you can see the old age is a significant risk factor for the peripheral vascular disease. And also the chronic pain is the most common issue, particularly at the old age. So that's why uh, we have selected this topic area to research. And if this condition is untreated, it can lead to serious co uh, cause organ damage and also loss of functional abilities. And also, all the age worsens the situation and also it will lead to the poor quality of life. And also our, uh, the main aim of our study is to examine the association between intermittent chronic pain and the quality of life among all the adult people who diagnose with peripheral vascular disease. And also the study for the guided uh, following three specific objectives. First one is it is to determine the level of pain experienced by participants with peripheral vascular disease, and also to assess the quality of life of the participants, and also to identify the association between participants' quality of life and also their intermittent chronic pain. So our methodology is, this is quantitative and correlational and cross-sectional study. And this study was conducted at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka, and uh, three vascular units. So, and also we have obtained ethics approval from the Nas ethics approval committee of the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And this, uh, the participants were 168 participants, including both males and females and age 60 and above who has diagnosed with peripheral vascular disease. And participants were recruited using stratified random sampling method with male and female strata. I will continue to methodology path. This study used WHO QO to assess overall quality of life and other four aspects of health in participants' quality of life. And also we use the pain rating scale to assess the pain of the patients. And Pearson correlation test was used to assess the association between pain and the quality of life. And after that, we use simple linear regression test. It used to determine the strength of association between pain and the participant's quality of life. Now I will move to the results sections. At the end of this study, we have found that, we have surveyed that there are 46 males and 54% females with a mean pain score of six and 5.52 respectively. And also you can see here, the mean quality of life score was 69.1 for the males and it was 70.1 for the females. And it indicate no big difference between pain is across genders, but however, there is a difference. Furthermore, these all descriptive statistics indicate that higher mean score of quality of life of 3.41 was reported from the participants with no pain and also uh, experience while participants with pain reported lower quality of life of 2.52 than those without pain. And you can see here our correlation matrix. So according to this correlation matrix, 
The psychological health aspect show the highest negative correlation with pain and it was 0.655. And then the results of regression analysis shows that if pain is increased by one unit, participants overall quality of life affected decrease by 0.22. You can see here the table. And also further, the psychological domain of health model uh, coefficients, this table shows that uh, if pain is increased by one unit, participants' psychological health decreased by 0.14. According to this model summary, uh, R square of 0 0.430 indicate that the 43% of the variance of psychological health is influenced by participants' pain. Now I will move to the discussion part. According to these all found results, uh, we can see one noteworthy finding in our study. So it is, even though pain is physical uh, sensations, it has mostly impact on psychological health of the participants. And as we know, pain is an unpleasant sensation for us. So especially for the older adults. So we have found that the mostly impact on the psychological health and also, this study found that the old adults with peripheral vascular disease who experience the intermittent chronic pain have the lower quality of life. It means the pain affect to lower their quality of life. And also, the study found that male had poorer quality of life than females. And also, male people experience the higher pain levels than females. And those with chronic, and some studies supported to our study, the with chronic pain had lower quality of life than those without pain. And also the findings suggest that pain affects the quality of life with lower pain resulting in the higher quality of life. And also the intermittent pain is a major contributor to poorer the quality of life among the peripheral vascular disease patients. While overall the quality of life affected by pain, psychological health aspect is the most affected health aspect by pain. As conclusions, our study can conclude that psychological health aspect of these participants may require more specific attention than the other three aspects of health. And while treating for the pain, this will help to enhance in the participants' mental well-being. And also, this study emphasized the need for comprehensive evaluations and also personalized interventions for patients with peripheral vascular disease. And also, we can conclude that the health professionals should be more vigilant about the prevalence of severe pain and develop effective pain reduction strategies. And also, social support groups and pain reduction interventions could improve their quality of life. And finally, to evaluate this effectiveness of these therapies and also to encourage improved outcomes for people with peripheral vascular disease, further research studies are needed. Thank you very much. Yeah. So by using this numerical pain scale, it is number into zero to 10. The patient can verbalize it. Yeah, patient can do that. By using this Pearson correlation test. So WHO QOL, the method that, that was used to take the uh, data. So after that, uh, we have put it to the correlation matrix. And also according to the data, we have found that the point, uh, it was the ne most negative uh, aspect is the psychological. 
yeah the quality of life decrease by the uh, most affect uh, the pain affect to the psychological health then reduce the quality of life it will lead to the reduced quality of life thank you very much yeah yeah yes. Okay, Mr. Fernando. Yeah. Okay. May I know your designation and the affiliation, please? Yeah, so I am from the Open University of Sri Lanka. Uh -huh. Are you a lecturer? Uh, no, I am uh, working as a, a temporary demonstrator. To which department? A department of nursing. Ah, department of nursing. That's why I ask. Okay, yes. very good presentation, Mr. Fernando. The, the topic you have chosen is the essential topic and also it's good. Uh, since the conference has organized in the hybrid manner, I couldn't see your slides. The slides was not moving because I couldn't see your table. That's why I couldn't uh, so your, uh, see your table and the uh, figures uh, as well. It's, it's okay. But I have one question. So you have mentioned in your results part that when you compare the male and female, the male's quality of life is affected by the pain in the peripheral vascular disease. But you did not mention the citation to support this finding. So what, what, what are the reasons to contribute that the male quality of life is affecting more than the female quality of life? Uh, sorry, madam. I didn't get your question. You didn't get, get my point. In the, in the, can you hear me clearly now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Okay. In the results part, you have mentioned the quality of life for the male is affected more than the female. Yeah. It's mentioned in the quality of life, but in the discussion part, you did not uh, give the supportive or citations uh, to defend your findings. So may I know what are the reasons for contributing this male quality of life is higher than the female? part I have already uh, for that uh, uh, here say the intermittent pain is a major contributor to poor quality of life among PVD patient so there's some research studies had found I have put it but what is the reason for the gender variation uh, why so, it's affected more in males yeah so according to our findings it's affected more in males than females uh. Is there any supportive? Uh, so in, so I did, didn't mention the, the literature supportive. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Okay, madam, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fernando, for your presentation. And uh, for the, the things, the session uh, chairs will be made by Dr. Mati Kandaya and uh, Dr. Uh, Vijita Pahibaran from uh, Japna, I assume. So our next presenter, uh, Fatima, but she's, uh, she informed us too, she will be late. So uh, we can go to the Atrupana GRSSB from uh, Sri Lanka Incentive Care Nurse Association. He will presenting assessing the factors affecting the organizational commitment among nurses.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Shalit Patrupani. Uh, I am a nursing officer uh, at uh, National Hospital in Colombo. And uh, also, the, I am the uh, president in Sri Lanka Intensive Care Nurses Association, also, and uh, vice secretary in Sri Lanka Nurses Association. Uh, my research topic is assessing the factors affecting for organization commitment among nurses in National Hospital of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, I would like to uh, present uh, my content in the uh, like this. And uh, according to my research study introduction, the idea of organizational commitment has an intellectual uh, appeal because of the relationship uh, ship of uh, commitment to turnover, absence, and organization performance also. And uh, all these are important to healthcare executives, especially in uh, for the nurses, uh, because uh, our nursing uh, executives, uh, they are attempting to stabilize a nursing workforce in the presence of the growing nursing shortage. And also organizational commitment has been studied in the public, private and non-profit sectors and more recently intermittently. According to my justification, organizational commitment is one of the factors that secure, safe, and high quality care of the patient. It also enhances motivation among nurses, which affected by various factors such as performance, appraisal. And also organizational commitments has significant impact on Uh, Dr. Vijita? Yes, somebody say. Can you see the screen? It's for sharing? Uh, now, now it's sharing. Can ask, ask, ask them to turn on the slideshow. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Is the justification slide I can see? Now it's okay? Now it's okay. Okay. It's okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Uh, in my justification, organizational commitment, commitment is one of the factors that secures safe and high quality care of patients. It also enhances motivation among nurses, which affected by various factors such as performance appraisal. Organization commitment has significant impact on employees' performance at work and also they mention commi commitment might enhance or inhibit employ employees willingness to do the job so the relation between organizational commitment job satisfaction and job performance has been confirmed in various studies many studies have also found that organizational commitment increases job satisfaction providing additional support for the positive relation between organizational commitment and job satisfaction and also the relationship between organizational commitment uh, and uh, job performance also. Not only that, many researchers have reported that the transformational leadership is directly related with organizational commitment. Unfortunately, there is also limitation of literature on this topic in Sri Lanka. Because of this reason, because in our country, where the health setup, health policy and other factors are quite different. That's the reason for uh, 
limitation of literature in our country. And organizational research, there is also social or cultural disabled bias also, because some unions, they always try to uh, stop uh, like these uh, findings. And also there is no research especially related to level of organizational commitment and factors that predict nurses' commitment to the organization in Sri Lanka. These are the, my objectives. My general objective is assess the factors affecting for organizational commitment among nurses in National Hospital of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Specific objectives to identify how family life affects to the organizational commitment. Other one is to identify how the work-related factors affect to the organizational commitment. Other one is to identify overall organizational commitment among nurses. Other one to identify the correlation between factors and organizational commitment. In my methodology, an uh, institutional based cross-sectional study design was conducted in the National Hospital of Sri Lanka, Colombo. Self-administrated structure questionnaire was used to collect data. And out of the total nursing staff at NHSL, it means National Hospital for Sri Lanka, of uh, 2,750 data from 349 participants were collected within 13 days in randomly. The questionnaire consists of demographic data, uh, questions to assess quality of life, benefit and work-life balance and possible feeling of possibility. Ethical consideration from Ethical Review Committee of National Hospital of Sri Lanka, Colombo and participant personal consent and data will protected for five years and then destroyed upon completion of the five years period. This is, these are the, my results. And, uh, according to uh, for data analysis, I use Excel software and SPSS. Uh, now you can see my result out of total figure of 2,255 uh, participants, 73% were female and 26% the male. The minimum age range was about 50 years and maximum age range from 31 to 40 years. Most nurses were married. 247 of nurses had nuclear family system and 74% they have their partners were employed. In this study, 55 percent respond have diploma in nursing, 38 percent have bachelor's degree and 6 percent they have master's degree. According to my uh, result analyzed by Scottis, uh, The result of the current study shows that satisfaction with quality of family life, quality of professional life, salary, income, working condition, working unit, union leaders or union support, board managers' attitudes of organization, gender, family member employment, working time and working experience had the positive association with organization commitment. And while age, family structure, number of children, level of education, marital status, and health status were not associated with the organization commitment. In my conclusion, the result of this study indicate that quality of family life, quality of professional life, salary, income, working condition, working unit, union leaders, Ward manager attitudes of organization, gender, family members, employment, working time and working experience were positive association with 
organization commitment and age family structure number of children level of education marital station status and health status were not associated with organization commitment in my recommendation as this research study the population of hospital sector further research should should study on similar research framework at different population group such as the banking telecommunication uh, even the manufacturing industry also ministry of health sri lanka nursing directors human resource personnel and administration officers of the hospital should develop various strategies to increase organizational commitment of nurses it will be important if human resource management ministry of health sri lanka nursing directors and union leaders and also the nursing leaders also these are the my preferences thank you Vijita, uh, do you have any questions? Mm, yes. Atrupana, Atrupana. Mr. Atrupana, the way you have done the presentation is appreciatable. Uh, so, uh, I have one more question. As per your findings, yes. you mentioned the family status or the family situation is not affecting the uh, organizational committee. Am I right? Because I couldn't uh, see the uh, graph or tables that's why i'm asking the family status are now now i can see the family structure uh, the family structure the family structure is not affect the uh, organizational commitment isn't it yes ma'am. okay okay thank you very much okay. uh, thank you very much for mr atrupan and uh, then we have Presentation from Halim FH from BMS Kalambu. Uh, she is presenting the quantitative and qualitative analysis of uh, phytochemicals. Good morning to all those present today. My name is Hafsa Halim. I'm an undergraduate in biomedical sciences at Mfimbra University, Florida to the BMS School of Science. Today, I'll be introducing me to, to my research project under the scope of herbal medicine. This project is under the supervision of Ms. Madara Senanaga and was part of my final year thesis. The title is the qualitative and quantitative analysis of phytochemicals and the determination of antioxidant and antimicrobial activity in selected species of syzygium plants in Sri Lanka. First, I'll give you a brief background into the subject. Generally, in society, many of plants are more likely to be accepted by the people due to having a better adaptability in the human body with fewer side effects when compared to synthetic drugs. Sri Lanka, as a tropical country, owns a wide variety of herbal plant species that have been used in the treatment and control of various diseases such as di diabetes and cancer. Example would be the pseudo labor products which have been used to treat stomach aches, headaches, and so on with their herbal-based medications. Now, it gives these plants the ability to tackle medicines are compounds called phytochemicals. 
Phytochemicals are secondary plant metabolites that are the primary source of the pharmacological actions of a plant acting on the body. In this list are some of the main phytochemicals found in herbal plant species and their respective medicinal properties. As you can see, most of them mainly possess antioxidant activity, which is the ability to scavenge toxic free radicals, antimicrobial activity, which can mean inhibiting or killing bacteria, and other activities like anti-inflammatory and anti-hyperglycemic activities. These phytochemicals, these phytochemicals can be found in different parts of the plant, such as the leaves, roots, or stems. In fact, one part may provide a particular therapeutic response, while another part, part may give an entirely different response. In Sri Lanka, the leaves are commonly used for medicinal preparations, followed by the seeds and fruits. Thus, in this study, I've chosen to study the leaves of the Cisium genus, which is part of the Myrtaceae family, comprising about 1,200 to 800 species around the world. These species are said to be rich in phenolic compounds, anti-inflammatory agents, as well as neuroprotective agents, thus making them promising candidates in the field of herbal medicine. An example of a medication available in the market based on this genus is the Cisium jambolinium, which is normally used to treat diabetes mellitus. Now, Sri Lanka is full of these species holding endemic ones as well. However, very few papers are available in the country highlighting the potential of these species being used in drug design and development, as well as in alternative healthcare. Therefore, the aim of this study was to determine its phytochemical content, antioxidant capacity, and antimicrobial activity of five selected species of Cisium plants in Sri Lanka. The selected species will include the following. First is Cisium multifolium, commonly known as Christina. It is normally used as a decoration or of buildings or houses. Second, a common fruit called Cisium samarandiens, or is referred to here as peony jambu. Third, a common spice, cloves, referred to as Cisium aromaticum. Its buds have been frequently used for treating toothaches. Next, Cisium cumino, also known as the Indian black plum. Black plum. Uh, compared to papers abroad, this has shown to have more potential compared to the rest of the species, such that medication based on this plant is already available. Lastly, a species not popular amongst locals is Cisium xylanicum, or is referred to as Yakulmara. Traditionally, it's been used to treat uh, rheumatism, but very few papers are available on the plant as a whole. Here are some examples of the current literature available on the selected species, ranging from having anti-cancer anti activity to treating conditions like diabetes and Alzheimer's. These species have potentially been used as di as a, uh, as medications in alternative therapy. Thus, I've chosen them for this study. This is a general overview of the entire research project, which began during February of this year towards late July. First, we collected the leaves of our samples and how we uh, and shared that shade dried them for about a week. <coughs> then we grind, grinded them to fine powder using mortar and pestle and mixed in distilled water as a solvent. We chose distilled water as as the previous which has shown that more polar solvents are able to extract by the chemicals better. After after 48 hours on roller mixture and then filtration, we have obtained an aqueous extract. Using this extract, we will carry out a qualitative analysis of common phytochemicals found in herbal plants using standard biochemical tests. We also carry out the quantitative analysis to the assessing its total phenol content using the polling chi method and total flavonoid content using the aluminum chloride calamitic assay. The results of these two were expressed in terms of percentage weight to weight for easy comparison. We also, we also determined its total antioxidant capacity using the fossil model day method and expressed the results in terms of ascorbic acid equivalent. And finally, we, we assessed its free radical scavenging assay using DBPH, from which we calculated its IC50 value for each extract. Then we carry out the antimicrobial activity using the agar well diffusion method, involving E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus as the test microorganisms and the gentamicin as our positive control. Each of these experiments were done in triplicates, and we used the SPSS software to analyze our results and present them as mean standard deviation. Coming to results from the qualitative analysis, the results show that all the samples contain reducing sugars, coumarins, phenols, flavonoids, saccharines, tannins, steroids, and terpenoids. About four of them contain quinones, about two, about two glycosides, and uh, three alkaloids, and about one just proteins. Regarding the total phenolic content, cesium cumini 
Sizzling community, which uh, showed the highest total final content about 13.7%, while the least was found in Sizzling Samaran games of about 11%. In the total found of content, CGM multifolium is shown to have the highest content about 20, while the least is found in CGM Samarangans with, with just about 12. In the total antioxidant capacity, the highest is found in CGM Cumini about 23.7 milligrams per milliliter. In terms of ascorbic acid equivalent, while the least is found in CGM aromaticum or as close. In the DPPS free radical scavenging essay, the lowest IC50 value was found in cesium aromaticum, while the highest was found in cesium xylanicum. In the antimicrobial susceptibility tests, none of the samples uh, showed an activity against E. coli, while about three of them showed uh, activity against Staphylococcus aureus, cesium multifolium, aromaticum, and cumin, with aromaticum showing the largest zone of about 12 millimeters in diameter. So to throw our results, we say that the extra selective possess anti-cancer activity, anti-inflammatory activity, and antimicrobial properties as this contain the necessary phytochemicals contributing to these properties. In a qualitative analysis, we, we found out that cesium multifolium, uh, multifolium and cumini as well as aromaticum contain glycosides, and these phytochemicals are able to remove specific sugar molecules, indicating that these species can be used to treat hypoglycemic conditions like diabetes. In a quantitative analysis, system community showed the highest total phenol content and total antioxidant capacity, showing more potential out of the five samples in the study. There are papers abroad supporting this evidence as well, and the fact that medications are already in the market is not surprising at all. System multiple showed the highest flavonoid content. The flavonoids have, you know, flavonoids have shown to have anti-hyperglycemic properties meaning that this species, which is normally just used as decoration on houses, could be potentially used as a diabetic medication as well. In the DPPS free radical scavenging essay, free rad uh, cesium aromaticum showed the lowest IC50 value, meaning it had the strongest scavenging activity amongst all the samples and can be used to treat conditions caused by free radical damage. Analysts revealed that there was a negative correlation between the DPPS free radical scavenging activity and the phytochemical content. However, this was came in as insignificant, so it can't be really sure that the phytochemical content uh, affects the scavenging activity entirely in this study. In the antimicrobial susceptibility test, there is activity observed against Staphylococcus aureus with aromaticum showing the largest zone about 12 millimeters. So this confirms that the species can show activity against gram-positive bacteria and could be used to develop plant-based antibiotics. However, no zones are observed for E. coli, maybe possibly due to the agus extracts being ineffective against gram-negative bacteria. However, there are papers that show that agus extracts of plants from this genus can show activity against the gram-negative bacteria. So a reason why it didn't probably happen in this study could be a difference in the extracts concentration or the there are difference in the extraction procedure itself. So from this study, we can say that the results of the, that the selected species of this study have high phytochemical content with some antioxidant capacity, with cesium cumini, also known as the Indian black plum, showing the best potential of the five, which is high total phenol content antioxidant capacity. Some of these extracts have shown to be uh, uh, can, could be used in diabetic medications, namely cesium multifolium, and antimicrobial activities observed against Staphylococcus aureus, which gives us hope that we can build plant-based antibiotics, especially in an area, area when we are dealing with antibiotic resistance. Mm -hmm. Thus, these species have the potential to act as sources of therapeutic drugs used in treatment and in alternative therapy. Now, of course, further studies in this area should include ant better antimicrobial tests using a wild range of bacterial species, as well as even evaluating the toxicity of these APUS extracts. Here are the reference list for any of you who are interested in seeing the literature. Uh, that's all I have for today. I hope, I hope I've enlightened you on this topic. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. The, we use the agar will deficient method.
Yes. The positive control is gentamicin and negative control is uh, other clear distilled water. It was about uh, six centimeters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Vijita? Yes, Miss Kani. Miss Kani, can you hear me? Can hear you. Yeah, okay. It's a very good presentation. The topic you have selected is the needed one. In my keynote speech also, I have mentioned about the phytochemical studies. It's needed for every each and every plant species and the uh, compound medicines also. Uh, I have one question. You have done the antioxidant studies as well as the antimicrobial studies also. Have you done the anti-diabetic studies, uh, anti-diabetic no. activities? Uh, no, ma'am. No, you, you, you did not know. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea? Because in the discussion part also, you have mentioned the particular species of the CCGM has the anti-diabetic activity. It's more using for the treatment of the diabetic mellitus. So is there any correlation between the diabetic mellitus and the antioxidant properties? Mm, uh, I don't think there was any correlation. Okay. Because you have mentioned in the discussion, but that's why I ask. Okay, so uh, for for my idea, I just ask where you have conducted these type of searches that phytochemical and the anti the antioxidant studies, antimicrobial as well. Where you have conducted? Okay, oh, conducted. I uh, conducted at my uh, institute BMS. Ah, institute of BMS. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Halim, for your presentation. So, uh, actually, uh, this I am request from you a morning tea break. After getting the uh, fifteen minute the tea break, we can start the next two presentation because the uh, otherwise uh, you are in get some uh, refresh project. Uh, I start the next session. So, uh, uh, Dr. Vijita, we need uh, fifteen minutes. Uh, to get a tea break here, then uh, we can start again. Okay, 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 thank you. Yes, we can have tea. And uh, before going to tea, I have to get a